first contact with Joshua Pope. Okay, welcome back. So for today's subject, being a Monday, I'm going to focus on the Nag Hammadi Library text, the Apocryphon of John. If you've got the, the gist of what I'm doing here, every day I've got a different topic. Monday is going to be the topic where I talk about God, uh, things of a spiritual nature, esoteric nature, and so on. Okay, so the Nag Hammadi Library. The Nag Hammadi Library was discovered in 1945 in Nag Hammadi, Egypt. They were a series of texts that were found in a cave. The unique thing about these texts is that they refer back to the time of Jesus Christ. They return, refer back to the time of what Jesus had to say after the resurrection. Now to me, I think this is very significant because we read through the Bible, we read the story of the crucifixion, we read the story of everything leading up to the crucifixion, but then we get to the crucifixion and afterwards and we really don't have a tremendous amount that we're really hearing afterwards actually from Jesus' own you know, writings or words. We're hearing all of these other accounts of the apostles. So I think this is very significant. This book here I'm going to read I think is one of the most important books in the entire uh, collection here. Last week I read from the hypostasis of the archons, very significant and important as well because we need to know who the true enemy is that we're dealing with here and this is a very very important book as well because it gets into really talking about God the nature of God and all that good stuff so let's get to it here okay the Nag Hammadi Library Apocryphon John it's also known as the secret book of John. So Apocryphon means secret book or secret revelation. Okay, this one is translated by Frederick Weiss. Here we go. The teachings of the Savior and the revelation of the mysteries and the things hidden in silence, even those things which he taught John, his disciple. And it happened one day when John, the brother of James, who are the sons of Zebedee, had come up to the temple that a Pharisee named Arminius approached him and said to him, Where is your master whom you followed? And he said to him, He has gone to the place from which he came. The Pharisee said to him, With deception did this Nazarene deceive you, and he filled your ears with lies, and he closed your hearts and turned you from the traditions of your father. When I, John, heard these things, I turned away from the temple to a desert place, and I grieved greatly in my heart, saying, how then was this Savior appointed, and why was he sent into this world by his father, and who is his father who sent him? And of what sort is that aeon to which we shall go? For what did he mean when he said to us, this aeon to which he will go is of the type of the imperishable aeon, but he did not teach us concerning the latter, of what sort it is? Straight away while I was contemplating these things, Behold, the heavens opened, and the whole creation which is below heaven shone, and the world was shaken. I was afraid, and behold, I saw in the light a youth who stood by me. While I looked at him, he became like an old man, and he changed his likeness again, becoming like a servant. There was not a plurality before me, but there was the likeness with multiple forms in the light, and the likenesses appeared through each other, and the likenesses had three forms. He said to me, John, John. Why do you doubt? Or why are you afraid? You are not unfamiliar with this image, are you? That is, do not be timid. I am the one who is with you always. I am the father, I am the mother, I am the son. I am the undefiled and incorruptible one. Now I have come to teach you what is and what was and what will come to pass, that you may know the things which are not revealed and those things which are revealed and to teach you concerning the unwavering race of your perfect man. Now, therefore, lift up your face that you may receive the things that I shall teach you today and may tell them to your fellow spirits who are from the unwavering race of the perfect man. And I asked to know it, and he said to me, The monad is a monarchy with nothing above it, 
It is he who exists as God and Father of everything, the Invisible One, who is above everything, who exists as incorruption, which is in the pure light into which no eye can look. He is the invisible spirit of whom it is not right to think of him as a god or something similar, for he is more than a god, since there is nothing above him, for no one lords it over him. For he does not exist in something inferior to him, since everything exists in him. For it is he who establishes himself. He is the eternal, since he does not need anything, for he is total perfection. He did not lack anything that he might be completed by it. Rather, he is always completely perfect in light. He is illimitable, since there is no one prior to him to set limits to him. He is unsearchable, since there exists no one prior to him to examine him. He is immeasurable, since there was no one prior to him to measure him. He is invisible, since no one saw him. He is eternal, since no one exists eternally. He is ineffable since no one was able to speak to comprehend him, to speak about him. He is unnameable, since there was no one prior to him to give him a name. He is immeasurable light, which is pure, holy, and immaculate. He is ineffable, being perfect in incorruptibility. He is not in perfection, nor in blessedness, nor in divinity, but he is far superior. He is not corporeal, but incorporeal. He is neither large, nor is he small. There is no way to say what is his quantity or what is his quality, for no one can know him. He is not someone among other beings, rather he is far superior. Not that he is simply superior, but his essence does not partake in the aeons nor in time. For he who partakes in an aeon was prepared beforehand. Time was not apportioned to him, since he does not receive anything from another, for it would be received on loan. For he who precedes someone does not lack that which he may receive from him, for rather it is the latter that looks expectantly at him in his light. For his perfection is majestic, he is pure, immeasurable mind. He is aeon giving aeon, he is life giving life. He is a blessedness giving blessed one. He is knowledge giving knowledge, he is goodness giving goodness, he is mercy and redemption giving mercy, he is grace giving grace, not because he possesses it, but because he gives the immeasurable, incomprehensible light. How am I to speak with you about him? His aeon is indestructible, at rest and existing in silence, reposing and being prior to everything. For he is the head of all the aeons, and it is he who gives them strength in his goodness. For we know not the ineffable things, and we do not understand what is immeasurable, except for him who came from him, namely from the Father. For it is he who told him, told it to us alone, for it is he who looked at himself in the light which surrounds him, namely the spring of the water and life. And it is he who gives all the aeons in every way, and who gazes upon his image which he sees in the spring of the spirit. It is he who puts his desire into the water light which is in the spring of the pure white water which surrounds him. And his thought performed a deed, and she came forth, namely she who had appeared before him in the shine of his light. This is the first power which was before all of them, and which came forth from his mind. She is the forethought of the all. Her light shines like his light. Her perfect power, which is the image of the invisible virginal spirit who is perfect. The first power, the glory of Barbello. The perfect glory in the aeons, the glory of the revelation. She glorified the virginal spirit, and it was she who praised him, because thanks to him she had come forth. This is the first thought, his image. She became the womb of everything, for it is she who is prior to them all. The mother father, the first man, the Holy Spirit, the thrice male, the thrice powerful, the thrice named androgynous one, and the eternal aeon among the invisible ones, and the first to come forth. She requested from the invisible virginal spirit, that is Barbello, to give her foreknowledge, and the spirit consented. And when he had consented, the foreknowledge came forth, and it stood by the foreknowledge. It originates from the thought of the invisible virginal spirit. It glorified him in his perfect power, Barbello, for it was for her sake that it had come into being. And she requested again to grant her indestructibility, and he consented. When he had consented, indestructibility came forth, and it stood by the thought and the foreknowledge. It glorified the invisible one, and Barbello, the one for whose sake they had come into being. 
and Barbello requested grant her eternal life, and the invisible spirit consented. And when he had consented, eternal life came forth, and they attended and glorified the invisible spirit and Barbello, the one for whose sake they had come into being. And she requested again to grant her truth, and the invisible spirit consented. And when he had consented, truth came forth, and they attended and glorified the invisible spirit, excellent spirit, and his Barbello, the one for whose sake they had come into being. This is the pentad of the aeons, of the father, which is the first man, the image of the invisible spirit. It is the forethought which Barbello and the thought and the foreknowledge and the indestructibility and the internal life and the truth. This is the androgynous pentad of the aeons, which is the decade of the aeons, which is the father. And he looked at Barbello with the pure light which surrounds the invisible spirit and with his spark, and she conceived from him. He begat a spark of light with a light resembling blessedness, but it does not equal his greatness. This was an only begotten child of the father-mother which had come forth and it is the offspring, the only begotten one, the father of the pure light. And the visible virginal spirit rejoiced over the light which came forth, that which was brought forth first by the power of his forethought, which is Barbello. And he anointed it with his goodness until it became perfect, not lacking in any goodness, because he had anointed it with the goodness of the invisible spirit. And it attended him, and he poured upon it. And immediately when he had received from the spirit, it glorified the Holy Spirit, and the perfect forethought whose sake it had come forth. And it requested to give it a fellow worker, which is the mind, and he consented gladly. And when the invisible spirit had consented, the mind came forth and attended Christ, glorifying him and Barbello and all those that came into being in silence. And the mind wandered to perform a deed through the word of the invisible spirit, and his will became a deed, and it appeared with the mind, and the light glorified it. And the word followed the will, for the wor because of the word, Christ, the divine autogens, created everything. In the eternal life, his will, and the mind, and the foreknowledge attended and glorified the invisible spirit and Barbello, for whose sake they had come into being. All right. All right, we're going to leave that there for today because there's plenty more to this. But this is a great start, okay? I'm going to continue on with this this uh, particular book over the course of the next couple of weeks. But here we have a very important aspect. We have a story where Jesus, Yeshua, is describing to John, God. All of the wonder and the glory of God and how the Christ light came into manifestation. So this is a lot. This is a lot of information. And if you really grasp what is going on here, I think you will be highly pleased with the way in which you're able to to have a deeper understanding of of the aspect and the mission and the words of Jesus Christ because this really kind of explains things in a in a much deeper fuller way than we are usually taught through you know such similar sources scriptural sources and so on it's quite possible why this book wasn't certainly allowed in the bible because these are the kind of things that are kept away. These are all part of the Apocrypha. We're very familiar books that are kept out of the Bible because for whatever reason, they don't cut the mustard with the powers that be. All right, so there you go. That's part one of the Apocryphon of John. I will continue on next week, picking up from where I left off with part two. Stay tuned. I'll be back. <laughs>